Welcome everyone. We are so glad you can make it. Thank you for making the time to be here. I'm Talia and I'm the content and community manager at Hugo Health Kindred. For those of you that don't know, Kindred is building a network of data enabled people who have been impacted by COVID and want to contribute to research in partnership with leading scientists. I strongly encourage anyone who is not a member yet to join us. You can go to kindred.hugo.health for more information. And it is from Kindred that you can enroll in the Yale Listen study led by doctors Iwasaki and Krumholtz and the PACS-LC trial. Um, so tonight we're gonna, if you've been to other previous cafes, we're gonna run it the same way. I'm gonna hand it off to our lovely panelists. Today we have Jamie Guckman, who is living with vaccine injury, and Ambika Shadow is living with long COVID, and of course, Dr. Erica Spatz. And they're going to give an intro about themselves, share their stories, and then they're going, we're gonna launch into some questions from them that they've prepared ahead of time. And then we're gonna do the live Q&A at the end. So if you have any questions, for Dr. Spatz, please put that in the chat. You can put it in now, you can put it in later, um, and we will answer as many as we can. And without any further ado, Jamie, if you'd like to share your story. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Jamie. I'm 39 years old. Um, I've had no prior medical conditions. Um, I got my first vaccine in January of 2021. Um, I am a teacher, so like as soon as it came out, I was rushing to get my vaccine. And in February of 2021, I had my second vaccine. And very shortly after that, I became very dizzy, lightheaded. Um, I started to get muscle pain, joint pain, brain fog, cognitive issues, rashes, um, vision issues, um, some of my symptoms that developed after that were extreme thirst, dry eyes, brain noids, poor blood circulation. Um, but for me, my biggest thing was my memory um, and brain fog. Um, I had a long journey. I've been to a lot of doctors. Um, I also see Dr. Vaughn. Um, I am undergoing triple therapy. Um, I have been tested and treated for microclots. And to me, that seems to have worked the best. And I am also on oxygen therapy, um, which also helps me tremendously. Um, in addition, I have an irregular EKG. Um, and I'm pretty I'm feeling pretty good considering how I've been feeling the past two and a half years, but I know that I still have some ways to go. I forgot to mention, <laughs> um, the night of my second vaccine, I did get very, very sick. I woke up in the middle of the night. I thought I was going to be sick and I walked to the bathroom. Um, I did pass out somewhere along my walk and I woke up calling for my husband. And um, at that point, um, I started to sweat profusely for several minutes um, and just asked for some Gatorade. And when I felt okay, I went back into bed. And that next day, my body felt like I had the flu, I couldn't lift my legs, my arms, I just needed to stay in bed. Um, and sadly, that feeling of heavy legs, heavy body can't get up, hits me quite often. So um, that is my story. Thanks, Jamie sister. <laughs> um, I just wanted to say my name is Mary Beth Cachetta. I go by MB. Um, luckily, I'm a writer, a medical writer, and um, a fiction writer. Um, so I write from bed a lot. And I'm very glad I, I don't have a more vigorous <laughs> career, let's just say. I got COVID in May of 2020. Uh, I never tested positive. It, the timing didn't work out. The pe the test didn't work out. Whatever happened, I never did. Although I read recently that um, something about people, something, some reason why some people don't ever test positive and it was something I had. Now I can't remember because I've got some brain fog. My um, long COVID was always neurological. My acute COVID was super neurological. Um, and the only time I went to the hospital was uh, because my heart was beating really slowly and the, um, the, the blood ox thing kept ringing, but my oxygen wasn't bad. It was still, it was like just at 90 and I was only ever going to go to the hospital that went below 90. I had all these little rules, but it was really low. Even for me, I had been a runner. It was like barely at 40 and I felt angina had 
chest pain. So I went and, um, but I was released because the way my COVID went was, was just cycling through like symptoms, cycle, cycle, cycle. And if, even if I had a terrible symptom, it, it would be um, sort of fading and the next one was coming on. So that's kind of how I experienced it. Um, and I stayed in um, isolation for a long time because I kept waiting for the symptoms to go away so I could wait a couple of days and then come out with to my family, you know, come out and be with my family. And the symptoms just never went away. It was sort of bizarre. Uh, I have, so three and a half years I've had it. Um, I've done some medical stuff. I have some nerve damage in my feet. My symptoms now are uh, what I call sort of COVID buzzing. My skin feels like it's going to buzz off my body. And um, I have peripheral neuropathy, hands, legs, uh, arms, and feet, uh, and I, I have brain fog and I have eye pain. Um, so, uh, I'm, I'm really happy to be here. I'm happy. We're going to talk about heart stuff. I know that there has been some talk about, there's going to be this epidemic of, you know, heart disease among people with long COVID. And I'm really eager to hear what Dr. Spouts has to say about all that. So thank you, Dr. Spouts. Go ahead. Um, hi, everyone. I'm really delighted to be here. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I am Eric. My name is Erica Spatz. Um, I'm an associate professor at Yale School of Medicine um, in the Department of Medicine, as well as in our Yale School of Public Health, our um, Department of Epidemiology. Um, I work very closely with Dr. Harlan Krumholtz, who was my main, main mentor for the last, has been and still is my main mentor for the last uh, 15 plus years, and have been lucky to get to know Dr. Akiko Saki, um, both through her work actually pre-COVID championing women in medicine and in the sciences, and then um, through our shared work together with COVID. Um, my focus um, outside of COVID was always on um, prevention, sh uh, partnership with patients, shared decision-making. There's a lot of uncertainty in medicine that um, is widespread about what is the best option or um, what is best for me. And that really varies based on a person's, what I like to say, what their biology is, as well as their biography. So even though there's a lot of mutual overlap, it's I use those terms to think about, um, you know, the biology is often things that we can get from the medical record, things that I see in the chart that I know about a patient before I even walk into the room. They're testable and they're readily available. And oftentimes we're making a lot of decisions around those things that are um, measured. And then there's people's biography. And that's their story. And there's a lot of biology in there because it also is their family history. It's their genetics, but it's also their experiences with health and, and illness, um, either personal or um, within their family or peer networks. It also includes where they are along the life course. Um, are they young? Are they older? What kinds of issues are they facing? Are they facing menopause? Are they facing um, divorce? Um, are they facing other kinds of um, uh, life stressors like discrimination, racism, microaggressions, financial um, uh, toxicities, uh, worries of the world? And knowing people's biology and their biography together can help bring a broader understanding of a person's um, total self. And then we could start to layer in what's happening, you know, and how is it impacting their lives? And how can we get to a better understanding of that? And how can we help people achieve their best health? Um, so that's what shared decision-making is. Shared decision-making is me as a doctor. Yes, I know the evidence. Um, yes, I have experience with other patients, but, and so I am expert, but patients are experts in themselves. Patients know themselves. And I've never known a person to make a bad decision for themselves when they understand like all the options. And I don't want to ever abandon people with that, with those, um, burdens, but I also want to support them and play a role as much big or small of a role as I can. 
And so I think that, so in cardiology, I've really embraced those concepts and have put those forward. It's what I teach around. It's what I do research around. And lo and behold, here comes COVID, right? It just kind of drops right on us. And it's full of all of the same things that exist within medicine, but we sort of reduce it to things that are black and white. Do this test, it has these results, these outcomes, do this, do that. You know, I often talk about like, it's like a little bit of like a train ride from New York to Boston. Here's the different stops. You get to the here, you go to the next stop, you go to the next stop. It's a linear roadmap. But medicine is messy. It's not like that. And um, COVID certainly unveiled that for everybody. It like just put a big spotlight on it. So my background with COVID and long COVID um, begins like everybody else's at the beginning of the pandemic and um, caring for people who survived hospitalization came out of the hospital and had a host of different medical issues that we were first trying to understand. So some of the patients that I saw in the very beginning were the sickest of the sick because that's what, um, that's, that's where we were at that time. And what we did here at Yale is banded together to say, I'm taking care of these, this patient, this one patient, these two patients, these 10 patients, these 50 patients. We're all seeing them from our different specialties. Can we start to meet to talk about what we're seeing, what we're doing, how we're understanding this? And um, we ended up forming very organically a, a, a post-hospitalization COVID clinic. And of course, as everybody's stories go, as the pandemic goes on, we realize that actually many more people are afflicted with symptoms that are um, going on past their initial COVID infection. And it includes symptoms that are occurring after vaccination as well. And so we became the de facto long COVID clinic and um, at Yale dating back to the earliest of, of days. Um, one of our main insights that we um, fought for very hard after a year and a half into the long COVID clinic was the need for a centralized primary care place that people could go to coordinate this care. Otherwise, we were a bunch of specialists engaged, interested, treating patients, but it wasn't fair to people because they were just being bounced around. We needed one coordinating person center that took everything and had a lay of the land and could bring it all home and be an ongoing continuous support for somebody. And finally, um, we established that. Um, also along the way, I'm a part of a CDC study called Inspire. Um, and Inspire is um, <clears throat> was stood up at very early on in COVID, even before we even understood tons of what uh, totally what was about what was long, long COVID was going to look like, you know, our surveys, you know, you put a, re, it's research, right? So you have to put everything through the IRB. You have to know exactly what the endpoint is at the moment that you start the study before we even knew all the different things that long COVID was and could be. So with the INSPIRE study, we enroll people at the time of testing and we follow them for 18 months, regardless of whether or not they test positive or negative. These are people that test that are coming for testing, at least in the early days of when we were enrolling um, for an acute illness, an acute viral illness. Um, so I've had a lot of learnings through that um, study itself, as well as connecting with national leaders um, and global leaders um, to understand what they were seeing. Um, so, I've all, one other thing I should mention is um, I was also part of a um, American College of Cardiology and ACC group that um, we led roundtable discussions back in the summer of um, 2020, 2020 and the, 2021. <laughs> Thank you. And that um, those roundtable discussions um, were with, uh, with such a diverse and multidisciplinary group that included patients. And then that led us to break off into these um, groups to then fur further corral the evidence 
that led to a consensus document that covered myocarditis, um, returning to sports following um, uh, COVID infection in athletes, and then in long and then a long COVID section. And I led the long COVID section, um, but also had hands in the myocarditis and um, return to play, as we call it. Um, so I, at Yale, I also I work with our athletes here, so I have that experience. And um, what can I share? I mean, I have learned so much from my patients, and I have learned from their experience, and then from trying to understand like what is at the heart of their symptoms. Why can't I, you know, how can I help them? Right, that's a journey, and. Um, I would say there's a few things that we think about in cardiology. I'm going to start off with just talking about a general kind of approach that we see this world through, but then try to get to some of the nuanced learnings with long COVID in specific. Um, generally speaking, I never want to bring bias into my interactions with patients. So I always want to have an active mind. I never want to say, oh, I know what you're going to come in with, because that is a that is a place that we will trip over ourselves and backtrack and then could miss something. So I still need to employ a traditional approach to thinking about people's symptoms. And I need to think about it in terms of, again, biology, biography, what is this person at risk for? making sure I don't overlook some things that, you know, happened pre-COVID that have nothing to do with long COVID. And I can't tell you how many people have a misdiagnosis of something that was written off, excused, you know, dismissed. Oh, you must just have long COVID, just have long COVID, but, you know, that must be your thing and have discovered um, uh, another medical diagnosis in the in that in its pathway. So I always keep an active mind and I always approach this to know because we still have to rely on a lot of the evidence and training and patterns that we've seen over the years. Um, when some of those more traditional cardiovascular conditions have been ruled out, um, I would say the things that I see that um, are very characteristic of long COVID are um, uh, symptoms that have to do with the heart rate and rhythm. So we're talking about palpitations, we're talking about, you refer, MBU said slow heart rate and skipped beats and fast heart rates that are not coordinated with what we're doing. So I'm sitting here, I'm relaxed, I'm a heart rate's up here, you know? Or, you know, I'm all tense and, and walking, but my heart rate's down here, you know, things that are discordant. Um, another um, symptom area that I, that I hear a lot about is chest pain, uh, chest pressure. And um, that's one of the areas that I do a lot of work in is in chest pain. Um, the third has to do with cardiovascular um, exercise and uh, exertional capacity. So for some people that means having limited capacity when they're exercising. For some people it means I'm good when I'm exercising but I crash afterwards, I get that post-exertional malaise. And understanding the metabolic delivery of oxygen muscle uptake that allows people to um, exercise and train and have derived the benefits that come with training. You know, um, when we exercise, if you haven't been exercising at all, I don't know if you've done it, I, I take mega time off and yeah, I'm short of breath and it doesn't feel good and I got to go slow. But if I go slow and I incrementally increase, I can get there. I can build up my exercise capacity. But, you know, what goes wrong when that when that when a person can't do that, you know, or a person feels a setback once they start that process. So um, those are the buckets of things that I often am um, 
you know, uh, talking to people about treating people, di trying to diagnose and then um, trying to treat. I'll talk a little bit about um, chest pain first. So with chest pain, you know, the first thing that came to everybody's mind and what we were all focused on was myocarditis. That's inflammation of the heart muscle. Is this myocarditis? And I did see my fair share of myocarditis cases, especially in people who had acute COVID and, especially, and also around the vaccine. So myocarditis is there, it's real. But what I did notice is that for many of the people I was seeing with long COVID, that wasn't, that wasn't what was going on. You know, we did the echocardiogram, the ultrasound of the heart, we did the MRI, we didn't see that. And what they were describing sounded a lot like some of the work I had done in women's, and then I do with in women's cardiovascular health. So women having chest pain, um, there were the arteries look good. I saw the arteries. They there were no blockages, but why were people having chest pain? And a lot of my work from women's um, cardiovascular health influenced my approach to long patients with long COVID who are having chest pain. Um, so early on, um, many of our patients with chest pain would have a lot of tests. Some were normal, some weren't normal. Some would have stress tests and have an abnormal test. And then we'd look at their coronary arteries, their heart arteries, and say, oh, but they look normal. Okay, so what is it? How do you explain those discrepant findings? And what we started to do is take people to the cath lab and test the arteries. How are they functioning? Are they dilating? Are they opening up? Are they relaxing when they should? Arteries should open up when you need more oxygen to bring to, to the heart so that the heart can work to uh, feed blood and oxygen to the rest of the muscles. Are they appropriately dilating? Um, are they spasming? And in many cases, we found coronary artery spasm. So these are things that are called endothelial dysfunction. You may hear about this endothelium. The endothelium is the lining of the coronary arteries, um, blood vessels in general, not just the heart arteries. And the endothelial lining is an active membrane. It's an exchange of oxygen. And there can be inflammation there. Um, and hormones affect these arteries. Uh, nitric oxide affects these arteries, right? If the arteries are potentially, the arteries can be big arteries, and then they can be the teeny tiny little arteries that infiltrate our heart muscle too. That sometimes is called microvascular dysfunction. And, you know, so we, know that these different entities exist in women's heart disease that explains chest pain, even when everything structurally looks okay, but the function is off. And um, I started to see these patterns in people I was treating with long COVID. And it has informed my approach to think about endothelial dysfunction as one of the mechanisms that explains um, chest pain and may even explain some of the exercise intolerance that we see um, in many people. Um, it may also explain some of the brain fog. If those teeny tiny blood vessels are not, you know, relaxing, you know, how is that affecting blood flow into the brain? Um, so those are some of the concepts that uh, I apply clinically and um, have not done research into endothelial dysfunction. I've my research in endothelial dysfunction is actually in women's cardiovascular health. This, this, that happens very commonly in um, the perimenopausal, postmenopausal phase when there's a lot of hormonal transitions. Um, but you know, um, I have seen that pattern occur and my treatment of endothelial dysfunction by and large has actually been quite um, helpful sometimes completely successful, sometimes partially successful, but has been something that we've um, oriented around. What is that treatment? Um, and, and someone wants to know, how do we improve the endothelial function of our, our own, of course? Yeah. Um, so one of the um, ways I, all, well, there's a few different approaches. So I don't take one approach, but the endothelium is, um, well, firstly, we need to we need to train our arteries. So I do a lot of training of the arteries. How do I do training of the arteries? 
breathing exercises and very low dose exercise um, that trains the arteries and not just the arteries, but the blood pressure, the heart rate to respond appropriately. I was referring before to the heart rate, um, the heart rate going up and down. You know, I use a lot of biofeedback mechanisms to uh, train um, people to regulate their own heart rate and regulate the blood vessels. So we'll do that through diaphragmatic breathing. Um, a lot of these concepts are well known by many people. I'm sure many of you practice these already in your lives around um, mindfulness or yoga. These are very common concepts, but really thinking about when I take a deep breath in, my heart rate increases. And when I breathe out, the heart rate decreases. And I can train myself to slow down my heart rate, um, speed it up. And I do these breathing exercises with people. I could teach people about the, you know, simple thing at the bedside is like the boxed breath. Breathe in, hold it, breathe out, hold it, breathe in. I'm doing it fast right now because I want to get through a few other things. But um, that's one aspect. Um, I'll, I'm going to save the exercise for a little bit when I talk about POTS and um, some of the other things, but I can get a little bit more into that. Um, some of the medication, um, some of the medications that, well, let me stick with lifestyle first. I have seen also um, anti-inflammatory diets be very helpful, um, avoiding big heavy meals, um, eliminating alcohol, um, eliminating marijuana. Um, I mean, these things are common. Not, you're not a bad person if you do it, but I have found that that those things to be helpful. Um, the other things that the medications, the primary medications that I use are calcium channel blockers. Calcium channel blockers are things like verapamil, diltiazem, amlodipine, um, nifedipine. These um, medications are commonly used. They're pretty well tolerated. They relax the blood vessels. Occasionally I use um, uh, nitroglycerin. Um, I also uh, will use beetroot extract prior, if, if exercise is a big um, trigger for chest pain, I will have a person um, take some um, beetroot shots about 45 minutes before they exercise. Beetroot's um, great um, for the endothelium. Uh, we also use L-arginine, which is an, an amino acid um, and uh, has also been effective in combination with these other um, therapies to improve endothelial dysfunction. Should I keep going or do you want to stop or ask questions? What, what's good? <laughs> yeah, we can, um, I mean, we can go into questions if, if, if we wanted. There's plenty of questions to go around. I know uh, Jamie and MB prepared some. Um, I mean, I'm happy to just go straight into what the questions are on the chat. Okay. okay. Yeah. And so I, tell you, I was going to, um, the other main, uh, I'll just give you like a headline just so we don't overlook it. I, um, I would love to talk about POTS. People um, have. I, if you haven't had a lot of people coming on talking about POTS, I can talk about POTS and, you know, what we've learned here and what, you know, our approach, um, there's a lot of tips there. Um, I think, I think that's great. Um, would it work, Dr. Spatz, if you took like the next 10 minutes to to talk about that stuff and then um, we can go into live Q&A after that? How's that sound? Yeah, that sounds perfect. Okay. okay oh, great. Someone and asked then... about pots and exercise, just so that's probably yeah, what you're yeah, going to talk about. I saw some things in the, uh, yeah. I, it, yeah, I can't we're getting... really get the chat, but I did see pots pop, pop up a bunch of a times. times so. yeah. We're getting a few people saying yes, pots. So, okay, yes, pots, um, yes, so pots. it seems like a, a green light. And then also yeah. everyone, just an announcement. If you do have questions for Dr. Spatz, please put that in the chat. Um, that's the only way to make sure that your questions are seen and heard. We, we cannot call on people because this is a webinar. So please just put your questions in the chat if you have them and we will do our best to, to answer them today. Thank you so much. All right. Okay. So POTS. Um, I want to start off by saying that POTS is more heterogeneous than we maybe even understood initially. And um, I want to give you maybe some of the some of the core understandings of POTS and when it's POTS that is abiding by the rules of what POTS originally is, the treatments work. 
but it's also complicated, right? Because there may be other things that are contributing to POTS that may not resolve all the symptoms. So what do I mean by that? So POTS, the definition of POTS, post, uh, uh, postural ortho, orthostatic tachycardia syndrome. That means that when people are standing up, they're in the postural position, that they, they are, their heart rates are going fast and they are not feeling good. They feel like they need to sit down. Some people can't even stand. Um, they can feel lightheaded. They can feel their heart racing. They can feel tingly. Um, they can feel like they have no energy and, um, and are going to pass out. Um, POTS was, is seen in astronauts returning from space when we remove gravity for so super long time, about 60% of astronauts return with POTS. And, um, we can induce POTS in people if we put them through bed rest, prolonged healthy people, bed rest people, not everybody, but many people. So the diagnosis of POTS is made um, using an active stand test, which is um, we measure the blood pressure and the heart rate when people are lying down flat for five minutes. Then we have them stand up and we measure their blood pressure and heart rate for 10 minutes. And the blood pressure shouldn't fall because that's something different, but the heart rate goes up by more than 30 beats per minute. And that's the formal definition of POTS. Now, I do have some people that don't meet that formal definition, but they have all the other symptoms. Maybe it's not 30 exactly. I'm not like, I'm not a person who's a stickler for the, you know, absolute criteria. If, you know, if it makes sense. It makes sense for me, but I do always do an active stand test. And um, what's happening? Well, our heart fills with blood. Blood comes in, the heart expands and then it pumps out that blood that comes into the heart. What does that mean? That means if I wanna build the most efficient system in the world for the heart, I want that heart to expand the most. So I could, so the most amount of blood can come in and then with every single squeeze, more blood comes out and I'm an efficient machine. And you know who does this the best? Athletes. Rowers and swimmers, they have big, huge hearts. And every beat is just maximized because so much blood comes into the heart, so much blood comes out. Athletes have slow heart rates. They don't need to work. I can do an echocardiogram, an ultrasound on an athlete and see that their heart is just like, eh, I'm so good at what I do. I don't even have to beat that strongly. So it almost looks like their hearts are not even beating strongly because they are that good at getting the blood out because they have dilated, they've maximized the amount of blood for every squeeze of the heart. What happens in POTS? The heart is shrunk. It's stiff. It's not, it's not dilating as much. And in POTS, there's less, um, the blood in the system is maybe just a little less. Maybe it's a little bit of a dehydrated state. So we've got this relatively smaller heart, less blood coming into the heart. The heart is not so efficient, but the, your body's telling, telling you, but I need blood. I need, I need to stand. I need to like do it. I need to do my thing. So the heart only has one option. It's to beat faster. Can't, it can't open up and take in more blood. It's just, there's something wrong, you know? Or maybe there's just, it's a dehydrated state. So the heart's opening enough, but there's just not that much blood coming in. So all it could do to sustain us is to beat faster. It's kind of a beautiful system in that way because you have all of these like, um, you know, promoters, inhibitors that like say, okay, if not this, then this, I'll just do that to compensate. And so with POTS, um, there's a slightly smaller heart. There's a slightly dehydrated state in the blood, in the circulation. And when you stand up, all of that gets like exponentially worse because now all the blood is like in your lower part of your body. And most of the blood sits in our pelvic area. And you go to stand up and now against gravity, which the astronauts didn't have, so they weren't working this out, right? 
against gravity, you have to pump the blood up to the heart. The heart has to fill with blood and um, be able to sustain cerebral blood flow to the brain, okay? So in this state, the heart just has nothing else to do but increase in its heart rate. And people feel lousy. People feel really, really lousy. So when I tell people this, like in clinic, you know, it helps to reinforce why we're recommending what we're recommending because, you know, you have a men people have a mental model now of like, ah, oh, I get why you're telling me to drink with electrolytes because I want the whole circulation to be full, enriched, engorged with fluids. And so salt helps you hold on to fluids. You may know that from hiking, take a bag of pretzels, take a bag of peanuts, right? Um, two to three liters of fluid a day. And if you don't have like severely elevated blood pressure, high salt, high, how high? About five to, five to 10 grams, which is about one to two teaspoons of salt. So that's part of it. We also use abdominal binders, which um, are these like Velcro, um, almost like compression socks, but for the, for the pelvic area. And um, wearing them like four hours a day, it doesn't have to be when you're standing up, just helps to shunt blood back up to the heart from where it's all kind of pooling. And then we do a, um, uh, exercise protocol um, that is uh, called the Levine protocol, which many of you may know, um, modified a bit because we're not usually just dealing with POTS. There may be some other things and we don't want to exacerbate post-exertional malaise. So the Levine protocol starts with all horizontal recumbent exercise for the first month. Why? Because when you're exercising, you don't have that extra pressure of getting heart, the blood up to your heart when you're erect. So your horizontal, the blood is using, just flowing right back pretty nicely back to the heart. And we do small doses of exercise and then some resistance training horizontally on the mat with some bands um, for the first month. And Again, any kind of exercise that is exacerbating symptoms is too much exercise. So we'll usually start with like, let's say five minutes on a rower. So what, yeah, what are the exercises you could do? Rowing, swimming, recumbent bike, maybe five minutes is too much. Five minutes for like a week, then adding on like two minutes, seven minutes, if you could get there for a week and then nine and so on and so forth. And um, in the second month, we try to get encouraged more semi-recumbent exercises like on a bike, regular upright bike. And then in the third month, um, you know, upright exercises. I try to tell people, don't let walking be your exercise. I mean, we all have to walk. We have to, you know, get food, go to the bathroom and stuff. But just let that not be your form of exercise because that may be, um, you know, uncomfortable, worsening things and, and such. Because the worse you feel, the more people will re, um, refrain from exercise. And that kind of worsens this cycle of the low blood volume state and the smaller heart. Um, exercise is a friend to expand the heart. Um, and, you know, I think what we've found is if we do this carefully and that we have been able, able to, um, have people tolerate this and improve their exercise tolerance along the way. Um, I'll stop there. I think um, we're at about 20 minutes left. So I want to make sure that there's time for questions. And I know that the chat is, um, there's a lot of questions in the chat. Thank you. It's great. Um, so I think what we'll do now is MB and Jamie. Um, maybe just sort of ping pong one than the other, um, picking a question from the chat or the questions that you prepared either or totally up to you. And, um, yeah, that's how we'll continue and finish out this amazing Kindred Cafe. So. Jamie, go first. You go. Okay. I feel like my head is spinning with so many questions that I <laughs> have a lot. trying to do the chat also. Um, but I think one of them I, is kind of similar to one of my questions, um, it says, what is the current thinking of symptoms caused by lingering viral RNA in the body? Um, is 
if this is a likelihood, what is the thinking of antiviral use? Um, I know you spoke a lot about um, like POTS and endothelial dysfunction. Like could viral persistence be the cause of the POTS and, and the endothelial dysfunction? Um, so I think that's what this person was referring to. Yeah, I, um, I, it is definitely one of the mechanisms that I think can underlie um, symptoms like POTS and endothelial dysfunction. And one of the reasons why, you know, and, and some, and some groups, research groups have, have shown that, you know, not for everybody, but have shown that there is viral persistence. But, you know, what we have seen is that when there is a reinfection, um, when there is, um, you know, sometimes a vaccine given or another viral infection, um, that symptoms can be exacerbated. And um, I think that uh, there also are times that, you know, our immune systems are down and then there's like a, like a flare. So, you know, I think that this idea that there could be some viral remnants lingering someplace is, makes a lot of sense. In my work, I can't prove that clinically, but um, as far as antivirals are, um, you know, that's the Paxlc trial, right? This is this idea that prolonged um, Paxlovid potentially could help um, to get rid of um, symptoms. Mm -hmm. You know, there's this paradox that happens too. For some people, it's not everybody, but um, I would certainly say that I've seen my full share of this, which is that some people get a reinfection and mount a big immune response and somehow get better yeah. with that reinfection. I have one person who I've been treating since like three years now, you know, and um, he just got reinfected for the, this is now his second, just second time with COVID. And, you know, immediately he was in a, you know, just in a panic. And I, you know, I got that. What did we do? We put him immediately on Paxlovid and I put him on um, metformin because there's a great study that was done. It was published in the Lancet looking at um, metformin, um, which is a diabetes medication um, for reinfection and showed that it actually had a really good results preventing long COVID. So we did a prolonged course of Paxlovid and metformin and somehow he feels better than his baseline, you know? Now, why, how can I explain that? I don't know other than to say that maybe something, is, you know, as I was able to mount this response, he was able to mount a response that got rid of some of maybe some viral remnants. That makes a lot of sense to me. So um, I don't know for sure, but I, um, I very much hypothesize and believe that that's part of the story. Did he have neurological symptoms as well that went away or were they mostly cardiology, cardiovascular? Oh, you know, okay. and, and when the flares come, the neurological symptoms come, like he has like um, uh, uh, pains in his feet that are like a neuropathic pain and in a toe and it comes with the chest pain, you know? So- mm -hmm. Um, I also potentially think that that could have, could be vascular. I don't know, but, um, you know, why they should both come, why they should, you know, come at weird times. And then now that he's having a response to this, it does, you know, at least confirm for me that that is, you know, at least part of the story. Thank you. Um a question from someone asking if you are seeing any um, ventricular arrhythmias in structurally healthy hearts along with some of these cardiac symptoms. Okay, so translate, I will do. Um, so a structurally normal heart is basically, you know, the heart muscle looks healthy, the heart is beating normal. Structurally normal heart is usually somebody who has, um, you know, a normal echocardiogram. Um, is that my feed or I hear some background noise? You, it's okay. Uh, okay. Um, the, um, oh, that works. Perfect. Okay. Um, so, uh, in a structurally normal heart, we usually, you know, we don't really see, um, life-threatening arrhythmias. Okay. 
um, ever, you know, but um, we do see, and I, and so I don't want to um, confuse terms, but, you know, so ventricular arrhythmias flags a life-threatening arrhythmia that can cause sudden death. You know, in a structurally normal heart that doesn't have inflammation in it, that's beating normally, we typically, it's very, very unlikely to see that. Now, there are, you know, we do see oftentimes like things like called that are extra beats. These could be PVCs, premature ventricular contractions, PACs, I think I saw that someplace, premature atrial contractions, they come from the top of the heart. These things are super common. If we all wore heart rhythm monitors, we would find some. And we would find varying degrees. And some people feel every one and some people feel none of them. <laughs> so it's a bit in this is outside of COVID too. But you know, anytime you have inflammation, increased adrenaline in the system, anything that is um, a, an, an acute illness, it's going to worsen these extra beats. So that could explain why people are having palpitations, not just because their heart rates are going fast or too slow, but there are these extra beats. Sometimes these extra beats can happen consecutively, and that's more of like when we call it like an arrhythmia, although sometimes they're just little short bursts that happen. Um, these things are not necessarily like, again, life-threatening. They can be very uncomfortable. Um, we like to diagnose them. I use a lot of um, uh, wearables, remote monitoring. I use the um, uh, Apple Watch or... Um, uh, a, a cardia device, which is what's inside the Apple Watch to measure an ECG so that people feel like it, they can capture what's happening for them when they're home. You know, for some people, it, um, it's not good to have too much information and other people want that data and want that power. So we do a lot of remote monitoring to try to capture and see what people are experiencing, make sure people, you know, have that information. And then if that is a problem, often we're using um, beta blockers or calcium channel blockers, something I was referring to before with um, endothelial dysfunction. Okay, I um, actually have two things. One, someone wrote, um, how do you treat microvascular issues? Um, and have you seen valve issues and hardening of the valves post COVID or post vaccine? And my question also to you is like, you seem, you know, very, you know, well educated, like how would people like us who maybe don't have access to such great doctors, like get this type of help? Sure. So, um, microvascular, um, disease, dysfunction, um, I think I, you know, I, I let me break that out into two components. So one is um, potentially related to what I was referring to before, which is like, how are the blood vessels functioning? Are they dilating? Are they constricting or spasming? You know, and what's happening at that microvascular level? Another um, possibility is, um, and Jamie, you were referring to this with being on um, triple therapy, is there microclotting, right? So is there, um, are the blood vessels plugged by little tiny microclots? And that's, um, that's an, a, a, a field of ongoing investigation, which is the microvascular is really hard to, we can't see it, you know, and so we're oftentimes trying to understand what's happening at that microvascular level by looking at pressure and flow and all sorts of sophisticated techniques. And um, so it is a field of inquiry. Um, it's probably too much for me to go into some of the testing that we can see the microvascular dysfunction in. Sometimes we'll, we'll do a specific kind of stress test to see microvascular dysfunction. Um, that doesn't give us an indication of what's causing it. Like if it's the vessel tone or if it's plugged blood vessels, we just say, Hey, the flow is impaired to the microvasculature. I'm done. <laughs> I don't know what else is causing it, you know? Um, but my approach is, um, again, training the blood vessels with exercise. Um, sometimes I'm using, um, statins and, um, angiotensin receptor blockers or ACE inhibitors, because those have been studied for microvascular dysfunction. Sometimes I'm using calcium channel blockers. Um, I have had 
um, people be treated with um, for microclotting, either with natokinase or with triple therapy. Um, we actually are going to start um, doing some of our own testing for that here, just in a small way, just so we can understand and have something to anchor on so that we are figuring out like who's, you know, who would be a good person to try this on and who, it, it, not a good person, but like a the right person who, where is this more likely to be the case that this is the underlying problem, recognizing that, you know, blood thinners can also have a downside, which is the bleeding aspect. Um, so uh, the South Africans have been, you know, doing a lot of work in microclotting. Um, Mount Sinai is doing some work in microclotting. And, you know, that that is definitely a, a, a possibility. There's also an idea of like, you know, what's the gas exchange across the microvasculature? Like what, you know, is there a good oxygen uptake? You know, so what's the metabolic state of those blood vessels in um, exchanging gas? Um, the other question, uh, was around like, how do you access, how do you access somebody who knows what they're talking about with long COVID? I mean, I feel like we're all kind of learning. So it's, um, it's, uh, definitely, I, I, you know, there, there are centers across the country for long COVID. I think, um, uh, we are trying to get some of this stuff out there to um, professionals, like me being a part of that American College of Cardiology roundtable and writing that piece tries to promote some of these concepts. Locally at Yale, we have a, um, a way to do um, clinical algorithms that help people to kind of move through these um, different considerations and diagnoses and to jog them to think about these things so that not everybody has to be referred to kind of tap into this. Um, we also do like e-consultations, um, which are like electronic consultations and just kind of asking around, trying to find who else is seeing who in this community that, you know, has a vested interest in this space. So uh, 86 people on here want to know if they could have a, an, a, an a, um, electronic um, meeting with you because they want you to be their doctor. But seriously, people are asking, how can they get, do they need to be referred? How can they have maybe even just a, um, a on online consultation with you or your team? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I was even just thinking like, if I re, because I know these are recorded and then they're put on the Kindred site, like maybe I could talk about what you're doing and bring it to my cardiologist and say, hey, can you test me on this, this, and this, or? Right, right. Um, no, I think these are good questions and there's not, you know, our system isn't built like this, right? <laughs> it's super hard. Um, I would say um, what we're, what I'm doing is not so specialized. It's not, and I think I, you know, there's part of it is like, I don't, have the answers and it's still a journey. But I think that the most important part, it goes back to the first thing I was saying, which is like somebody who is partnered with you, who's listening and who's an advocate, right? Like nobody has the answers, but somebody who says like, look, I'm still taking care of this person, but I'm struggling. Could I reach out to, to a colleague to say, what would you do? Or, you know, consult with the evidence and such. So we've, um, like with our long COVID team, I was mentioning, we, you know, now have a primary care lead on this in a primary care clinic, and we still continue to meet regularly so that we can share, disseminate that knowledge, empower primary care providers with this kind of information. Very logistically, um, yeah, I mean, if you have, I'm happy to help in whatever way I can. Um, I don't necessarily know that that is um, like a personal consultation, but it could be. And so um, it, could, it could look a lot of different ways. Someone wants to know what the prognosis of cardiovascular diseases in long COVID patients is. Is that a, an answerable question? Hmm. I don't think we totally know um, yet. Um, I can, you know, we've had a lot of people recover. And that's a good thing, you know. I've had a lot of people um, have significant improvements 
in their lives and some people who are feel like long COVID is behind them. Mm-hmm. And I really didn't think I was going to get to that place to hear that, you know? Um, so that gives me a lot of, um, hope and promise. Um, I also have people who continue to have like good periods and bad periods. You know, I was doing really well up until blank. And then now I'm back to where I was. Um, and a very minority of patients who haven't seen improvement, you know, and that is really frustrating and awful and just devastating for every, for everybody, but mostly that person, of course, but, um, also you feel pretty helpless. So, um, you know, I would say, um, the prognosis overall is good for most people and, we can't forget the people who are still struggling. Do you have any any quick, I know we only have three minutes, but a reaction to the serotonin <clears throat> dysfunction theory that came out in Cell and the journal recently and was in, covered in the New York Times? Yeah, yeah. That's, um, you know, I think these are super powerful findings. Yeah. And give us a really good lead. You know, um, there was another study that looked at cortisol deficiency. This study is serotonin. And, um, you know, I wanted to say, you know, the CDC gets a lot of like pushback, you know, that they're slow and everything, but there's some really super smart people there. And very early on when we were putting together our CDC study before really any of this was out there in the public, they said, nope, we're going to look at, you know, MECFS. We know that this exists. And they've been in this space for decades, you know, and um, it's not always what you see on the headlines or, you know, it's easy to like, you know, kind of um, be critical of these places, but there's like really smart people who are doing this hard work in there. And, you know, from all of my conversations with them, from what they know from other viral illnesses, this is a heterogeneous thing, and it's not going to be the same for everybody. I would love to get to a place where we do a panel and say like, what are you my are you microcladding? What's your serotonin level? What's your cortisol level? Like, are there viral remnants? Are you mounting a proper immunologic response and get like a personalized like understanding of what's happening so we could get to the bottom of it? Because as you were saying, MB and Jamie, like the symptoms are so diffuse, you know, going to a neurologist, going to a cardiologist, going to a rheumatologist, it's like it's you know you feel like you're just running in place sometimes. And so having a really, you know, if our science can develop to understand the root cause, I think we will be in a better place. I love the vision of the panel. That's a beautiful vision for the future where we just give some blood and then we can, you know, it can be known. That's great. All right. Great. Well, thank, thank you, you so, so much, much for having nice. me today. I appreciate it. It's thank really you. Lovely. Yeah. There's yeah. lots of lots in the chat. Uh, uh, people yeah. really appreciating how clear you were, and um, just thank you so much for being here and talking to us. We really appreciate it. Great. Um, thank you all for all the yes. work you're doing. Okay. Thanks, everyone. This was awesome. Thank you so much, Dr. Erica Spass, for the incredible information. <laughs> that yeah. was amazing, and just like so well said and everything just covered so many important points um and jamie and mb for being amazing moderators and for um asking such great questions uh normally at this time i would read off all the events that we have coming up but we actually are slowing down a little bit for the holiday season so i don't really have anything to announce in that regard we might have a fireside chat uh next month in november so you know keep an eye on your email for that invitation if that does come through Um, But I do want to say if anyone would like a copy of the chat of today's chat, there is some good information in there. You can email me tomorrow, Talia at Hugo.health, and I will be able to send that chat to you. And as always, we will be posting this video on, on YouTube. So thank you all so much for coming, and I hope to see you at the next cafe.